So, it's actually antenna season here in New England. What's antenna season? Well, for us, antenna season is when all of the leaves come off the trees and you can actually see what you're doing. And, uh, you know, guys are outside throwing wires up over trees and uh, putting in uh, halyards and all kinds of pulleys and arrangements to get their wire antennas ready for the very brutal winter that we have here. Oh, plus you can't talk about antennas unless you have an antenna in your hand. That's kind of an unwritten rule. This is something I built for the Cub Scouts a few years ago. It's one of those antennas that you give to a kid and you send them through the woods crashing to find a beacon that you've put out there, you know, to do direction finding and homing on a beacon. And it's made out of a regular tape measure. So as the kid crashes through the woods, you can see the elements just fold over. It's got a simple hairpin match and a, uh, a ballon wound right on the, uh, the boom. And then it goes into your little walkie-talkie or whatever you're using uh, to, to listen to find the, uh, the beeping thing. But enough of that. Why are we talking about antennas? We just went through a very boring uh, video presentation on loop antennas. Uh, we, we built uh, different types of tuned and untuned and coaxial type loops over the summer. Um, as I approached the winter, I wanted to do some work on the, uh, the 470 kilohertz band. And, uh, you know, uh, down there at those low frequencies in the uh, kind of the uh, I guess we'll call it the medium frequencies or the low frequencies. Um, you need to have something to fight the noise when you're receiving. And I always like to use beverage antennas, which are these long wires that are terminated. But uh, with the loop antenna still in my mind, I decided to put up a loop. And uh, I just uh, had such good luck with the loops, I just used one, in fact, at the Deerfield Ham Fest. It's called Near Fest here in New England. And I wanted to actually demonstrate some receivers on the air. Now what do you put up in a fairgrounds that's got power lines going over your head and distributions every which way? And every time you put up a wire antenna, all you really hear is noise. So I took a piece of coax, 75 ohm TV coax, RG6, and I made about a 15-foot loop out of it, and I shorted the, the center conductor and the shield together, and then soldered that to the outside shield, closing the loop as a 15-foot loop antenna. And then I simply uh, brought that up at about the 15-foot uh, level at the top and just off the ground on the bottom, between a couple of pine trees that were right next to where we set up to sell our... Uh, our radios for the flea market and uh, I was picking up stations from uh, the broadcast band all the way up to 25 megahertz Av actually even the CB band was coming in on this thing and people were absolutely amazed that just a piece of coax folded around itself no transformer no amplifier nothing was working so well but it tells you that uh, simplicity sometimes solves your problem so if you're thinking about a loop antenna, there's the simplest one for you. Just wrap the thing around, solder everything together, and uh, uh, see what you can get. But for my loop antenna, I took my existing structure that you've seen in the other videos uh, with the three turns and uh, the split at the top, and I just put in a simple uh, four-to-one uh, transformer hooked up backwards, the one side on the loop, the four side on the coax back to the uh, station. And I've been using that now for about a month and it's been working very well with the summer noise. And uh, some, some loss of course, I buried the coax out to it, put it in the woods a little bit, out of sight. This is station RBU uh, from Russia, it's a time signal operating on 66.66 .66 kilohertz coming in with a pretty good signal again this is the passive loop but now I'd like to go one step further 
I'd like to make a little remote amplifier box for that loop and see if we can do some filtering as well. So let's finish off a loop uh, by making an amplifier and see if we can get good performance uh, in the uh, LF frequency range. And we'll see how it acts also up in the shortwave range. It's a pretty big loop and with three turns there's a lot of inductance there. So I'm not sure it's going to work too well in the shortwave bands. But again, I'm going for operation between 100 kilohertz and 500 kilohertz primarily. Let's see if we can make a loop amplifier. So if you're like most hams, you're building a project like a loop amplifier because it's fun, because you might learn something, and you might actually be able to pick up some signals. Now realizing that hams are by nature, can I use the word cheap, thrifty? Maybe you have an austere amount of junk in your junk box. And of course there is a certain amount of laziness involved. You don't want to do too much work when you're working on a project like this. I would suggest that you go online and find some of those fine loop amplifier projects. Uh, the circuit cards are all built for you. Um, it's a tried and tested circuit. And maybe that's the way you should go. And I think you'll end up spending less money and less time uh, getting it working. But for those of us that just love to build things, we love to drill plastic boxes and metal boxes and mount connectors and try to make 29 cent transistors uh, into uh, a circuit that performs uh, all kinds of tricks. This is the project for you because the loop antenna has become a very popular way to fight urban noise and even suburban noise now that we have solar chargers and pool heaters and all kinds of interesting new Wi-Fi repeaters and microcells all around us, power line communications and all kinds of noisemakers. The loop antenna has really turned out to be a winner especially for those that can't put up a full-size beverage antenna that's uh, half a mile long. So the first question, and let me just move the camera a little bit. The first question is, what kind of box do you want to put it in? Now, there's positives and negatives to all different kinds of boxes. These plastic boxes are available in an IP rating. That means that they have some weatherproofing that's guaranteed. And, uh, of course, what are we going to do? We're going to drill holes in it and spoil all of that, so we have to be careful. Um, for a project like this, this is appropriate. Hey, it's not a shielded box, Mike. What about that? Well, you can put some, some foil in there, or some, just some heavy braid between the connectors, and that's going to be good enough for this loop antenna. Now, if you would like to use a metal chassis, then you're going to have to either get an IP rated metal chassis, or you'll have to put a little goop around the seal, let it cure, and then button it up, and that goop will form kind of a gasket. Now, because uh, we have a couple different styles of boxes and a couple different styles of construction, I think I'm going to go with two different circuits. One that's a minimal parts, just get the job done circuit, and another that's more of a deluxe circuit that's going to include filtering and things like that. So we'll build up two of these and that should be interesting. Well, the first thing you need to decide is how are you going to handle the entry points to these boxes? Now the least expensive and probably the best reliability would be to just simply drill three holes uh, one hole for the exit, and one hole on the left, one hole on the right for the loop antenna. And then use some RTV around the, the holes as the cables squeeze through, and that's going to give you a pretty waterproof circuit. Unfortunately, that doesn't lend itself to the kind of uh, construction and improvements that I make on circuits. 
I'm going to be pulling the box off and on the loop many times. So I need to have real connectors on these boxes. Now if our, our loop was made of RG8, we would probably use PL259 connectors or type N connectors. And then once we're done, we would tape them up with some of that goopy tape that makes good seals. If we were using RG58 or RG223, we would probably use uh, BNC connectors. You know, BNC connectors, they make a, a pretty good connector for, for a box. It's quick on, quick off. But I am using RG6. RG6 is a TV cable. And so I would be using the regular, wow, will that focus? Type F type connector. And uh, once you're in the cable TV business, you have interesting tools that you can use to strip the RG6 and things to put on the, uh, the fancy connectors that they give you. These are awesome. So I'm going to stick with uh, the Type F connectors for my setup because I'm using a complete 75 ohm type system. And my 100 foot of cable that's buried out to the loop is all 75 ohm coax. So we're going to use that TV, cable TV type approach on the boxes. But uh, if you're in 50 ohms, you might as well use a 50 ohm connector. And uh, something that allows us to uh, take the box off the assembly to be able to disconnect the loop and disconnect the feed line so we can do some testing here in the shack. There are probably uh, 25 videos on YouTube describing how to properly terminate 75 ohm uh, TV coax uh, with your uh, type F connectors. The only comment I'm going to make on this is that you have good, better, and best. And if you do it right, you end up with something that looks like this. And it's very strong. There's no, you know, it's strongly attached to the coax. It's good, a good connection, and uh, you buzz it with your meter. So that's all I'm going to say about terminating coax, because that's a pretty boring uh, subject. But needless to say, we're going to have to do that uh, for this project. Similarly, we'd like to use garden variety transistors. These are transistors that you actually grow in the garden. Like the 2N2222 and uh, some of these larger TO5 transistors can be used for some of the wideband amplifiers. They're also appropriate. So if you can afford the wideband transistors, uh, go ahead and use them instead of the 2222. Either one are going to work fine for this project. My guess will probably end up with a four transistor circuit for the deluxe, maybe a five transistor circuit for the deluxe, or and for the simple circuit I think we can get away with maybe two transistors. We're going to go both ways, a simple loop amplifier and a more complex loop amplifier. Um, also we need to bias our loop because we have an amplifier out there. So we're going to be running DC through the cable. That means we need a way to put power into the cable at the shack and we need a, a place to separate the power from the RF out at the loop antenna circuit. So we're going to be stealing from uh, some ideas that are out there. Um, certainly low frequency operation is nothing new. The loafers and uh, NDB beacon people and uh, our brand new 2200 and 630 meter ham bands as well as the experimental low frequency beacons and operators that have been on the air for some time now have produced a lot of circuits that we can borrow from. Um, I like this circuit. Um, it's a balanced amplifier. Very, very simple. Uh, Push-pull balanced amplifier. It goes right into the base of the transistors. And uh, you come out through a transformer and you transform that down to 50 ohms. Very simple. Uh, forgiving uh, at these frequencies, you can use almost any transistor. 2N2222, 3904, B1, 
BC500 series of, of transistors. And then our favorite, the uh, Class A high feedback, uh, very strong amplifier that's been so popular. Any of those TO5, TO39 style transistors gets a little bit hot because you're putting some serious current through it, but that's a workhorse type amplifier. And this one's been modified to be able to work at lower frequencies by bumping up the capacitor values. And by using a few more turns on the toroid, we're going down to 50 kilohertz. Now, does this hurt the top end? Yes, it's not going to be working up into the into the top of the shortwave band or up to 50 megahertz like the regular one does. But we're interested in the low frequencies with this oversized loop anyway. I don't expect I'm going to be using the loop much above 5 or 6 megahertz. So there's some building blocks. Also over here I've got a, a schematic of a little more elaborate loop amplifier. This guy, he's using the push-pull topology but with a, a grounded base or uh, uh, the emitters of the transistors actually become the inputs. Now why is this good? Uh, the loop antenna has a very low impedance. So using a low impedance input device uh, such as the virtual ground of an op amp, or in this case, the emitters of, uh, of transistors that are common base amplifiers, uh, is a good way to terminate the loop. So it should give better performance than the uh, going into the base of the transistors, which are by nature higher impedance. Uh, this one actually has some compound amplifiers uh, on the uh, collector. So you're getting some extra amplification before going into the, uh, the push-pull to single-ended transformer at the output. I don't think we're going to get that fancy. I'll probably put the transistor right at the uh, collectors of those uh, common base amplifiers. Then we'll decide what we're going to do next. But I think to start, we're simply going to use our simple amplifier. And we're going to hook that up to the existing... Uh, about 4 to 1 ballon that's connected to the loop right now. So all we're going to do is add some amplification. That's going to be step 1. So it's a transformer input feeding this broadband amplifier. And we'll see if that can pep up the loop just as it is. That should be a very simple circuit. We still will need to get bias into the amplifier. So we'll need to have a bias T set up. But that's where we're going to start with this circuit. So here is our bias T wired up and we have a nice schematic. Um, I've got 12 volts as my source and out at the amplifier I'm going to regulate that down to say 8 volts. Now I might have a voltage drop on the line and also the regulator, if it's a linear regulator, it might need more uh, voltage range than that. So, in that case, you would use a 15 or an 18 volt regulator. So, if you have a problem with regulation at the other end, and I suggest you use a linear regulator, try a 15 or a 18 volt uh, power supply. Now, there's lots of different kinds of power supplies. I like to use up these old wall warts. You guys are familiar with those. Now, this one feels heavy. And it puts out 0.85 amps. This one feels light and it puts out 1.5 amps. Why does this one put out more than this bigger one? Well, it's because this is a switching power supply. I think uh, since we're very interested in VLF, very low frequencies here, and low frequencies, that we should avoid using a switching power supply. If you do use a switcher, make sure that you run the, the DC cord through a toroid or put a bunch of beads on it to try to reduce the EMI coming from the supply. Better to use an old-fashioned transformer style, oversized, so that uh, perhaps our circuit only draws 25 or 50 milliamps. You're not going to get much ripple out of this because it's a uh, it's pretty big transformer. 
So stick with the linear supply for the bias T. So let's go through the circuit. Um, I've got a 0.1 capacitor right across the input and that's simply to get rid of any RF noise that might be on that power supply. It's another sneak path uh, that will feed right into our receiver. We don't want that. Then I've got a diode and that's going to act as a kind of a polarity safety device. If you hook the uh, the 12 volts or the 15 volts or the 18 volts up backwards, the diode won't uh, conduct. Then I've got a fuse, an inline fuse, and uh, I haven't shown an LED, but off this point I also have an LED or a lamp, so that if that fuse blows, the lamp will not light. So you can choose to put a, uh, you know, a 12 volt lamp, or you can put a like a 560 ohm resistor and an LED off this point to give you an indicator. Then I have a larger capacitor and this is kind of like the filtering capacitor and the bypass capacitor at the other end of the choke. Just to make sure that there's nothing riding on this DC I've added this extra capacitor. And it's just an electrolytic between 22 and 100 microfarads Finally, we have our little one millihenry choke, and uh, between the receiver and the loop, we have a 0.1 microfarad capacitor. Pretty high voltage. Use good quality high voltage capacitors, and you won't have any trouble uh, with your bias T. So let's take a look at the construction. So we've got two terminal posts where the power is going to come in. This will allow me to use a power supply of almost any kind. I've got a lamp. I've got the uh, connection to the receiver, and I've got the fuse holder. I don't actually have the fuse screwed in yet, but it's going to go right there. On the other side, I have an SO239 because that's what's going out to the loop. I have no idea why I put an, a uh, PL259 on the cable, but that's the way it goes. And uh, It's actually a good thing to have two different connectors so you don't get mixed up with your bias T. So, uh, there's nothing uh, exotic. This is a very easy build. Hope you can see in there. There's, there's not a lot to it. It's a very simple project. And uh, if you're going to run remote amplifiers up to, say, the 100 milliamp range, then you need a bias T of, of this, this type of quality. This is just an old leftover project box that had a lot of holes in it. And I'm just using that as the bias T chassis to get some reuse out of some junk box parts. We're going to be uh, building a bias T on the station side. This is a device that uh, should be able to handle up to one amp of uh, current. We're not going to draw anywhere near that, but the choke should at least have heavy enough wire if you want to put something uh, crazy on the end, like a really big Class A amplifier or something like that that's going to draw some power. So uh, you can make a homemade choke yourself. This one here is a one millihenry homemade choke. Here's a bobbin I got out of an old ATX power supply and that's been wound for about 500 microhenries. Anything be between 500 microhenries and one millihenry will easily give you 10 times 50 ohms impedance down to probably a hundred kilohertz. So uh, that's a good place to start for the bias T. You're not going to really have any loss and any loss you do incur is going to be so minor it doesn't mean much on the uh, this end of the coax because the amplifier up at the loop end is what's setting the noise figure and driving the coax. So having a little extra attenuation in the bias T is not really going to affect anything. So just get a 1 millihenry choke or a 560 microhenry choke and something like a 0.1 microfarad capacitor, a good quality ceramic 0.1, and you'll be okay on the bias T side. So let's say I want to use a random choke in my bias T instead of just going out and buying a 560 microhenry or 1 millihenry choke. I want to see if I can use a choke from my junk box. 
So the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to use my signal generator set for 500 kilohertz on the high side and maybe 100 kilohertz on the low side. Pick a couple frequencies, you know, 5 megahertz on the high side, uh, you know, 50 kilohertz on the low side, whatever range you want to use the choke over. And then uh, set it at a level so that you've got a meter or a scope that's essentially giving you full scale. Now the input to a scope, or in this case this RMS voltmeter, is a very high impedance. And we know the impedance of the generator is a very low impedance, around 50 ohms. So if we just use a T, we can hook up various unknown chokes and we can see what happens to the meter. If the meter deflects a lot, then we know, you know, for instance, if I'm going to put this choke on here, what's it say, 470K. I'm going to take a guess that that's a 47 microhenry choke. That's a guess. Let's hook it up. And uh, I'll back this camera off so you can kind of see what's happening. Now, up on the meter, it did go down a little bit. Here, I'll disconnect it so you can see. See that? So that choke looks like it's fine at 500 kilohertz for our bias T. And we could use that all through the shortwave band. So 47 microhenries, that's probably a good, a good choice if you're just worried about the broadcast band through the shortwaves. But we want to go down lower. So what we're going to do next we're going to lower our frequency on our generator to, let's say, 100 kilohertz. Okay, we're now at 100 kilohertz, and I've re-zeroed the meter. I've, I've uh, set the meter to full scale. And now I'm going to connect that same, what we think is a 47 microhenry choke. See what happens. Ah! The 47 microhenry choke has significantly uh, reduced the voltage. It's cut it in half. So, we know that basically when you cut the voltage in half, you're creating a voltage divider. So, in effect, we can probably say that um, it has around a 50 ohm impedance down here at 100 kilohertz. So, it's definitely not the kind of choke we'd want to use down here. So, I'm going to disconnect that. And I'm going to hook up one of these chokes that I purchased from DigiKey, it's a one millihenry kind of choke you'd have in a switching power supply. Let's see what that thing does. Let's hook her up. Wow! Hardly any effect at all. That would be a good choke. I think we want to use something like that. So a little uh, 50 cent choke is doing the job down at 100 kilohertz. But, how is this choke going to act up at, say, 5 megahertz? So let's change our frequency. Okay, we're here at 5 Oops. megahertz, and I'm going to hook up that same choke. It's a little 1 millihenry. Just perceptible. So, I can declare that this little cheap choke is going to do the job in our bias T just fine. Let's try some other mystery chokes. Um, I'm going to go back down to 100 kilohertz. Okay, here's one that some of you guys will recognize. It's an ordinary 2.5 millihenry choke. Let's see how, how that thing does at 100 kilohertz. Ooh, it's invisible. The 2.5 millihenry choke is invisible at 100 kilohertz. So there's another good choice for you. Ooh, what's this? Looks like a small toroid. Let's try this toroid. Looks like it's got about 20 turns on it. Ooh. Wow. Guy's doing pretty good. That's probably like a Type 60 core. And it's got probably 25 turns on it. It's working beautifully as a choke. What's wrong with a toroid choke, right? Let's check it up at 5 megahertz. Okay, we've got our type uh, 61 ferrite core.
core. We're going to hook it up here and see what it does at 5 megahertz. Wow, I'm not just nothing. So the message is when you're down here at 50 ohms and you're simply trying to achieve 10x or 500 ohms of impedance so you're not disturbing the 50 ohm line, it's not hard to do. You can do it with conventional chokes, you can do it with uh, single wound chokes, and you can do it with, you know, toroids if you want. So maybe we'll just use this toroid. But um, not a difficult thing to make a bias T work over a modest frequency range like 50 kilohertz to 5 megahertz. And that's kind of the range that we're mostly interested so we in. We build ourselves a little bias T box that's going to allow an ordinary 12 or 15 volt wall wart to power our amplified loop across the yard. Um, it's got uh, a fused situation and we have a pilot light that tells us if uh, there's an overload condition or something is shorted out there. And we have the two connectors, the one that goes to the receiver in the shack and the one that's going to feed the antenna that's in the remote loop location. 